introduce uh, Dr. Ed Huffman. Thank you. Well, this, this, uh, the original title of this talk was A Time Permitted Guide to Quackery. And that's because uh, I basically was asked to fill in for whatever we couldn't on the, uh, on the program. Uh, but it's no problem for me because I can just go on. I, could just, I can do a Saddam Hussein four-hour mother of all battles speech if you want to. Or I can just stay up here for five minutes or something. So Jim's going to gonna gavel me down when I start going over time. It's an area I've been interested in since, I guess, maybe the mid-1990s. I've always been a skeptic and a science-oriented person, and I guess I thought these days were over back in the 19th century, but they have come back. And they have uh, resurged in the late 20th, just like they did in the late 19th. So let's talk about what quackery is. I, this is my, almost everything in here is my opinion, so I'm not, even the historical stuff is just stuff that I've come up with from reading over the years and from my own experiences, so Obviously, just take it as that is just a one person's opinion. But my definition of quackery is it's a medical practice that is considered and then considered by the person that's selling it and by the person that's consuming it. It's considered validated in the absence of empirical science. That's well, kind of a Weasley definition, I think. Uh, I would like to say that it's medical practice that's not backed by science, but in fact, I do non-science backed medical practices every day. And that's because medicine is both an art and a science. But what is intrinsically understood by everybody that practices legitimate medicine is that what we know about medicine is potentially expandable using the scientific method. That what we call the art is something that can eventually, given enough resources and given enough time, be measured, quantitated, uh, protocolized, basically made into a, a cookbook, into an algorithm. And in fact, during the course of my career, that's what has happened. Um, science has eaten away at the edges of the art of medicine, and medicine is now much more of a science than it was even at the beginning of my medical career, which was in the 1970s. We see it in every specialty. But the, so we recognize that there are some things we do out of practice, and because we feel that they're right, but they have not been scientifically tested, and we look at that as something that's inferior, that needs to be improved. And in fact, it's an ongoing process that happens all the time. It just can't be done all at once because the resources aren't there to do it. But quackery is different. Quackery is more like religion is that in that you start off with a conclusion and all the data have to fit that conclusion and any data that don't fit the conclusion are ignored or explained away. So it's the approach, it's the approach to the thinking that separates legitimate, what we call science-based medicine, or in the art and science med of medicine either from quackery. Let's go to the next slide. So why, are we why am I interested in quackery now? Well, uh, up in, you know, through, during my young adult life, the only interest was historical. It was kind of something that could be laughed away. And nobody I knew went to quacks. The closest thing would be some people went to chiropractors and as we show later, I don't think chiropractic is complete quackery, although I have to qualify that statement a bit. But that's about the closest that I experienced as a, you know, as a, as a youngster growing up. And we let's go back into the history of, of, uh, of medicine. Of course, people have been trying to take care of sick people in to prehistoric times, but science-based medicine is a very new concept. It's, uh, you know, some people call it the youngest science. And I really don't think that there was much in the way of science-based medicine until the 19th century. Uh, the idea that washing your hands prevents infections was not even appreciated until 1847. The germ theory of disease was not appreciated until the uh, 1860s. And so what we call modern medicine today was an, is an evolutionary process that started back in that time and continued through the 19th century. The problem is, is that medical education as it developed in the 19th century was completely libertarian in that anyone could set up a medical school irrespective of where it was, whether it had any resources, whether the person that set it up had proper qualifications, and whether or not the teachers that were hired to teach there had any proper qualifications or proper training. And uh, at that time, 
science was ascending. People in general society liked science. They thought science had improved their world, and they wanted medicine to be more scientific. So the public became ever more aware, and um, philanthropists who funded most of the things at the time, most of the research at the time, became ever more aware that quackery had really gained a foothold, that with the development of science-based medicine was also an extension of non-science-based medicine or quackery. So by 1910, there was published the Flexner Report, which is a book-length report that really standardized medical education and what the medical school that I went to in the 1970s and the ones that the young medical students are going to today are essentially a philosophical extension of the Flexner Report. This should have been the end of it. And in fact, for a while it was. Science continued to be respected by the general public. Um, and it continued to be something that people liked to learn about. Um, up until, in my view, the early 1960s. And at that time, the scientists, we started seeing more uh, fictional treatments of the evils of science in the science fiction realm in, in uh, books and in movies. We saw, and I think it's probably a, uh, a, an offshoot of the Red Scare and the Cold War, people started viewing scientists as inhuman, as white-coated, ultra-conservative people with their own agenda that would take over the world and would have no problem um, harming innocent people if, it, if they could prove uh, their hypothesis. And so by the 1960s, as the counterculture's development, there was a pushback against science. Uh, initially, that pushback was from the left. So you had people, the, the sort of the hippie movement, the beat movement, that pushed back against what they thought was a science and technology-driven civilization. They wanted to push back against the nuclear scientists. So the initial uh, defense of quackery was from the left. We started seeing people talking about herbal medicines and uh, natural products instead of drugs uh, as being uh, ideal in terms of treatment. Um, then an interesting, and it's been fun to watch this over the years, it's one of the fun things about history is living through it and looking back on it even just a few decades. To me it all changed in 1980, or there was, the pushback was no longer from the left, it started coming from the right, and I date it to Carl Sagan, who was, an, for those of you who lived there, he was an incredibly popular scientist. I mean, he appeared on The Tonight Show over and over again, and, and Johnny Carson was genuinely interested in what he had to say. John, Johnny Carson's a huge science, was a huge science promoter, unlike just about any other uh, talk show host now. And uh, th he was an enormously popular character, but his image was totally different. First of all, he was an atheist, and he made no bones about it. So that was number one, strike number one in the, in the views of the right. Um, then he also gave up that image of the skinny-tied, white-coated scientist. He had kind of a, for that time, trendy hairstyle, and he wore a turtleneck, casual-looking guy, obviously a left a left-winger. <laughs> So the right was there to spring on it, and as you know, really, before 1980, the right wing did not incorporate much in the way of, of uh, the religious right. Uh, Reagan built the coalition that allowed him to develop a lot of political power by bringing in the religious right, and that's where anti-science started coming in from the right. So by the 1990s, you have the old guard left pushing back against science, and you have the new right wing push back against science. The left-wing pushback against science isn't quite as obvious now as it was uh, then, but it's still out there. Um, if you go to Huffington Post, which honestly is one of my favorite um, websites for news and for politics, entertainment, whatever, but their health section is basically all quackery. It's like 90% quackery, and that's definitely a left-wing site. Um, Bill Maher, who is an atheist extraordinaire, is an enormous promoter of quackery and uh, a purveyor of uh, conspiracy theories about conventional medicine. So the pushback from the left is still there. So basically, science-based medicine has been caught in a pincer movement from both the right and the left political realms. Um, then two enormous things happened to accelerate the promotion of quackery. <coughs> The first was the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which was passed in 1994. Uh, it was predominantly a Republican-initiated uh, act, but it was also supported by Democrats, and it was signed into law by um, none other than Bill Clinton. 
But what it did was it took all food supplements or nutritional supplements out of the radar for the Food and Drug Administration. So they no longer had to approve uh, nutritional supplements before the salespeople could market them. Now, they were still restricted into what they could say. If you sold a food supplement, you could not say that it treated a disease. But you could make what's called a structure function claim. So you can say some herb, you can't say that it cures prostate cancer, but you can say that it promotes prostate health. And in a little bit, I'll show you some of the keywords that, uh, that, 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 that help you uh, learn about uh, how to recognize quackery right off the bat without spending too much time or too much of your uh, valuable time reading into some nonsensical diatribe. But this was an enormous setback for mainstream medicine which mainstream medicine did not realize it had been stabbed in the back. And I still don't think it understands how much it has been stabbed in the back. Science-based medicine has been on the retreat ever since this act has been passed. And in fact, even the restrictions that, uh, the, weak, the weak restrictions that DSHA 94 left on food supplement marketing are, are violated left and right. I mean, you can tune on to, to like the regular uh, broadcast networks on the weekend and they'll be half hour, hour long infomercials. Have you seen Kevin Trudeau? I mean, he basically says that cancer can be prevented or cured by this or that nutritional supplement. And I mean, nobody does anything about it. And the guy's been to prison at least once. Um, essentially, there's no reasonable effort at, at enforcing even the weak provisions of, of the, of the DSHA 94. Then the other thing that really helped uh, Quackery was the popularization of the World Wide Web, which I date from 1995. Obviously the web was around, I think since 89, I think when, uh, when it was invented. The 95 is when it really started becoming popular. People started getting dial-up internet access in their homes. And uh, this of course gave a great venue for anybody to market anything. And you were limited only by the skill of your website designer. If he or she could design a really professional looking website, you could look as good as, as uh, the National Library of Medicine's website.